All right, we're just going to do a quick little sound check for anybody that's online. Can you hear us okay? Yes, thank you very much, everybody. Um, so my name is Cinnamon Moffat. I'm the research program manager here at Oregon State University's Hatfield Marine Science Center, and I will be your host for today. Um, for folks that might be new to this event, uh, our seminars are hybrid events. So that means that we have folks online and folks in the room. For folks that are online, you can communicate with us using the chat function, but your cameras, mics, and screen shares have been turned off for this particular event. Um, if you have any technical issues, you can put those questions into the chat and we have a volunteer, Roseanne, in the room um, who will help navigate those technical questions. She will also read out any questions you put in for today's speaker, so use that chat function. For folks in the room, because this is a hybrid event, it does mean when we get to the question and answer section of this particular presentation, you will need a mic to ask your questions so folks online can hear as well. So when we get to that part, just raise your hand and I'll run around the room. Maybe not to those folks back there, <laughs> but I will bring you a mic um, so you can answer the questions or you can use the mic stand that's about halfway up. Um, the other thing I ask is that if you haven't already, there's a sign up sheet right outside the door uh, that allows me to justify buying cookies and coffee. So make sure you sign in if you haven't already. Um, Okay, a couple little quick uh, announcements for you. I wanted to promote next week's seminar, which is already December 7th. Can't believe that. Um, James Kulikowski is the director of uh, the Coastal Oregon Marine Experimental Station here in uh, Hatfield. And he's gonna be talking about apex mothers. So talking about the secret lives of mama sharks and their babies. So that'll be kind of a fun way to uh, have another talk around our sharks. And so I'm excited about that one. Um, but the reason that you're all here for today is uh, our speaker. Um, and Carl Hendrickson is a NOAA Coastal Management Fellow working with uh, the Oregon Coastal Management Program, which is part of the Oregon Department of Land Conservation and Development. The only reason I can say all of that is that I was a NOAA Coastal Fellow as well many, many, many years ago. Um, but Carl has uh, been brought on to provide capacity uh, to advance sea level rise adaptation planning at a local level using existing and emerging data um, and resources in Coos County. And so Clatsop County, look at me, um, in Clatsop County, which he's gonna talk about today um, with more expertise than apparently I can read his bio. Um, but I'm really excited to have him here. He was here a while ago as part of another presentation and I was excited to learn about his work and we invited him to come back and talk with us. So I'm actually gonna hand this off to you and you can take it away. How's this mic? Everyone hears me? Great, okay. Thank you, Cinnamon. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Carl Hendrickson. As mentioned, I'm a NOAA Coastal Management Fellow with the Oregon Coastal Management Program, housed within the Oregon Department of Land Conservation and Development. The project I'm presenting on is based on work created by Meg Reed, a former fellow, Christine Shirley, and Tanya Haddad, another former fellow. With that, I will present on how OCMP and my fellowship project engages with coastal Oregon communities to help build capacity to adapt to sea level rise and other climate change impacts. So I want to give you a little background on DLCD um, and OCMP, these acronyms I'm throwing around just to place where my work happens. Uh, so DLCD, the Department of Land Conservation and Development, administers Oregon's 19 statewide land use planning goals, which cover land use like agriculture, forestry, and urban growth boundaries, hazard planning around wildfires and droughts, and estuarine and marine spatial planning. And we work with and provide support to cities and counties. Um, which meet these 19 goals. So much of the reason that Oregon looks the way it does with few populated cities and a lot of forest and ag land in between is because of our unique land use system. So now you know exactly what DLCD does. We'll get into what OCMP does. So the Oregon Coastal Management Program um, is part of a network of coastal management programs. All coastal states, territories, and Great Lake shorelines have a coastal management program wherein the federal government realized how important our coasts are and how diverse each one is, giving states the authority to manage them better. Um, so we work to help jurisdictions implement our policies and plans. We're also a very networked program, meaning that we partner with natural resource agencies, universities, jurisdictions, and stakeholders to help create these plans to help manage our coasts. So we partner with 11 other, 11 state agencies, including ourselves, all coastal counties, and all coastal cities. Um, also note that our Oregon coastal zone is pretty unique 
in that it spans from the crest of the coast, coast range and includes all coastal watersheds out to three nautical miles for the territorial sea, making it one of the most large and comprehensive coastal management zones. Just to give you a little comparison, this is California's coastal management zone, um, which typically is only about 1,000 yards from the high tide mark, sometimes as low as 500 yards. Um, so DLCD has a, or OCMP has a really special coastal zone because it's so comprehensive. So now I'm gonna give you a little background on my fellowship. Um, so NOAA, Office of Coastal Management, uh, administers the NOAA Coastal Management Fellowship. Um, they accept applications from host agencies like the OCMP. And then I apply through a process through Oregon Sea Grant. Um, so that's a bit of this confusing nature of how this fellowship in particular works. Um, and the actual fellowship that I'm working on with OCMP came from a plan that looked like this. Um, I work in Clatsop County, specifically in Clatsop. I work with the city of Cannon Beach and Fort Stevens State Park and OPRD. Seen up here. Um, the work that I'm doing is based off of our sea level rise adaptation planning materials, which is sort of what I'm gonna get into today. Um, and what using those materials looked like for my fellowship was meeting with communities in their locations. This is the fire station in Lewis and Clark. Uh, to talk about sea level rise and to hear from them how it will impact them so that we can better help those communities. So finally, we'll get into sea level rise in Oregon. Um, there's a lot of different flavors of sea level rise going on. Uh, we have erosion of beaches and dunes on our shorelines, threats to development and property built right up to that waterline, and regular flooding in our communities now. Um, the amount of sea level rise experienced in a region is based on a number of different factors. So you can see here some projections from Astoria, Oregon um, at the mouth of the Columbia River. So we're looking at around 2070 and 50 years is uh, the numbers that we mention a lot. And we're looking at three to four inches to two to three feet, uh, which is really a big range, but even three inches can easily flood 30 feet on a flat floodplain. Um, just wanna note that just because we have this really wide range here of potential sea level rise scenarios, doesn't mean we're not confident in the fact that it is happening right now. Um, and so we're trying to work with communities to understand that even though we're not certain how much there will be, there will be sea level rise. We need to work to adapt to it. Some of these local factors, particularly in Oregon, um, relate to the Cascadia subduction zone. So everyone here, I'm sure is familiar with this and the tsunami potential that it brings. But actually on the northern coast of Oregon, this gives us an advantage for sea level rise. Um, so as that Juan de Fuca plate goes underneath and the North American plate actually rises up a little bit, um, we have land elevation uh, keeping up with sea level rise almost. So sea level rise has been relatively slow here in Oregon, um, but it is accelerating in the future and um, we still need to be sure to plan for it. Um, so Oregon is experiencing the pervasive effects of sea level rise, which are often hitting the underserved populations, rural communities and fragile ecosystems the hardest. And so the OCMP works with local governments on the front lines responding to these impacts and we help to build flexible frameworks so that we can implement adaptation measures to reduce harm to people, property, and coastal ecosystems. Uh, to do that, we've released these materials uh, to help adaptation planning and capacity. First is our impact explorer, then our impact assessment tool, and finally the planning guide for the Oregon coast. These tools have been the backbone of what my fellowship project works with, um, and this has been the first trial of them with the public. They're all publicly available, but uh, we're sort of trialing them in class up. So diving in, here we have a screenshot of the Sea Level Rise Impact Explorer here in Yukuna Estuary, Oregon. We're there at that little star at the Hatfield Center. Um, so this is an interactive online map tool available on the Oregon Coastal Atlas. There's our link at the bottom, coastalatlas.net forward slash sea level rise. And the pink layers that you see in various areas indicate different sea level rise related hazards. I'm actually gonna take us up to Seaside, Oregon now in Clatsop County, which I think has a really good set of examples of these different hazards going on. So first, zooming into the estuary, you can see these different uh, mosaic of these pink layers. And each different shade of pink represents different number of hazards expressed there. Um, so we have an erosion hazard from the Dogami, the Department of Geolo Geology and Mineral Industries. We have storm waves, which comes from a FEMA velocity zone, representing a 1% chance of flooding and a 20% chance, 26% chance of flooding over a 30-year mortgage, which is a time span people are able to plan in. Glass is a sea level rise layer uh, that was actually developed in our estuaries by a former OCMP fellow. And what we're showing is 1.5 feet of sea level rise 
plus a 1% storm event, because uh, we know storm events play a really big role in the flooding experience through sea level rise. And I think it's especially important now that 1% storms seem more like 10% storms. Uh, we're seeing a lot more of that impacting floods. You also see some cross-hatched areas um, in there, which represent places that are completely surrounded by a sea level rise hazard, which is a unique hazard in and of itself. You find yourself on an island inland. Um, you're still being threatened, even if you're not flooded. So the Impact Explorer is our first tool. Um, but before I get into that second tool, the impact assessment, we need the information from the communities um, about said impacts of sea level rise. And so to do that, we held a series of workshops in Clatsop County that have really been the crux of my fellowship project. So in March of 2023, um, we talked to communities in Clatsop County and the city of Cannon Beach to hear about how sea level rise will impact them. We showed them maps of these layers in their communities and collected information on important buildings, infrastructure, neighborhood, natural spaces, beach access points. Um, we're working with those communities to understand what hazards look like to them and creating a plan to support more resilient communities. Uh, so that looked a lot like meeting with city planners to go over these maps and discuss what we're kind of talking about and connecting directly with community members, bringing them into or going to them um, and being in the room together to talk about these impacts. So I mentioned we held these series of workshops up in Clatsop County. The first one we held was in Seaside. Uh, this workshop was intended to reach out to the Latinx community up there. We worked with a local community group, Consejo Hispano, to plan for the event. We hired a facilitator and translator, and we even worked with two OSU grad students who were fluent in Spanish to make sure we were able to reach this community. I also think it's really important to mention failures. So I'll tell you that we had zero Spanish speaking attendance for this meeting. Um, it was a bit of a letdown. It was actually a really big letdown, uh, but it taught us a lot of lessons and it's really given us uh, a springboard to say, you know, we need to do better uh, as the state agency. And so we need to work with more partners. And I'm going to get into a little bit of that later. Uh, the next workshop we held was in Arch Cape, which is a small isolated community. Um, they care a lot about their beach access and erosion. They're really right on the shoreline. Um, and they're also uh, isolated in that there's no businesses or anything there. They have to travel to get to their services. So flooding of transportation is a really big deal to them. We held this workshop in the local fire station. Next, we were in Cannon Beach, um, which deals with a lot of shoreline erosion and shoreline protection structure issues, dune restoration and riprap and things like that. Um, we held this at the city hall there. We met in Lewis and Clark, um, which as a community is a little more disjointed than some of these other ones. And so they were really interested in how to be more prepared for this type of flooding and how to get resources when they need them. We met at the local fire station there. And up in Brownsmead, further up the Columbia River, um, it's a really pretty unique community, completely surrounded by dikes. Um, and so sea level rise and overtopping there, which they've experienced in the last few years, is, is really a big deal to that. Um, so we've been working with them on how they're going to adapt into the future. We met there at the local Grange. Um, so at these workshops, we got really great attendance. We were super pleased with the folks we were able to reach. Uh, but I'll tell you that the average age was well above 60. Um, and so we knew we were missing a big segment of the population. So we decided to really up our youth engagement and we met with students at all four of the coastal high schools in Clatsop County and at the community college. Um, and there we talked with you know hundreds of students in a day to work with them and do this same process. So some of the topics we covered, um, well, the important thing we're trying to do is, is work from the bottom up. Uh, we didn't wanna come across as the state coming in and telling people, there's this really big threat coming and, and here's what you need to do. Um, instead, we wanna understand how the community values assets, how sea level rise will impact them, and then work with that community to help prioritize and pursue those solutions. Um, this could be, and certainly will be financial assistance, but also tactical assistance for protection measures, city planning and code language changes and community emergency preparedness. So we wanted to understand what is important to the community and really particularly, why is it so important to you? Um, what makes you a cohesive community? What's your sense of place when you're here? What does sea rise look like? Is it storm, storm surge threatening dunes? Uh, is it king tides overtopping dikes and levees? Is it downtown flooded um, during king tide events? You know, every place is different. Um, what's going to be at risk? Is it businesses we're worried about? Private residences, public services, beach access and roads? And how would you cope with that? Um, you know, are there alternative options if you do have flooding from sea level rise? 
And how can we go from being reactive to these flood events to proactively getting ahead of them? Um, so all that's to say, we did a lot of, you know, if the water level got to here, what would you guys do? Um, next, I'm gonna show you some of the responses we did in these workshops. So we had people around tables, we had them looking at these maps of our sea level rise layers, um, and we asked them to annotate right on the map. Um, you know, tell us where you see flooding, tell us where this important beach access is. This is a pretty tame one. I should have had a picture from the high school. We had 50 sticky notes on there identifying every important coffee place to them. Uh, really pretty fun to see their responses. Um, we also handed out worksheets um, with questions to try to match the input to uh, the second tool I'm about to get into, um, some of the different vulnerabilities. And all the while, we were sort of stalking around the room, taking notes on some of the just deeper conversations happening, some of these more existential changes that the community is feeling. Um, so we recorded these different ways. You see those green sticky dots. We asked folks to go around and check out what other groups had seen and sort of put an exclamation mark on it. Let them know, you know, we, we really care about this. Um, so through this, we got both qualitative and quantitative responses. Um, so now we have that data from the community about what matters to them and why. We can input this into our second tool, the impact assessment tool. Um, so this is just a look at it. It's created in Excel and it helps communities prioritize their assets based on what people value the most. The different scores, different tabs have scores based on responses. So the higher the score, the more important the asset is. Uh, but you know, we don't wanna burden people with having to work through a spreadsheet like this. We wanna engage with them, not give them a migraine. Uh, so we tried to collect as much information as possible so that we could do this process for them to give them that result. Um, so these are some fictional, fictional examples, but I think they do a good job of illustrating some of the different variety of answers we can see. Um, in the second tab, risk class, um, we can see that risk class is represented using a FEMA ASCE 24 classification. So that's a lot of mumbo jumbo to say, um, you know, scoring based on what FEMA would say is important. We're interested in the community, but also it's, it's important to know what is nationally recognized. The users tab um, lets folks score assets based on who uses a population. So if an underserved population really uses something like a food bank, it's gonna score higher than you know, a, a nice hotel along the beach that really doesn't need to be there. Skipping a few more tabs, the community importance score, I think is a really important one. Um, it really gives folks a chance to say, you know, this is super valuable to us. We need to retain this in the community, regardless of what the other scores say. You know, this beach access point really defines who we are. And so they can add a little extra score there. Um, I'll say that each of these tabs can be weighted differently. So if the community decides that the user population of an asset is the most important, they can give that double points, something like that to help adjust the prioritization. So once we've run this for a community, we're gonna give them a list of prioritized assets that looks a lot like this. So this is from Arch Cape um, and the different colors here represent different levels of scoring. So first up, I mentioned Arch Cape is a isolated coastal community, no businesses to speak of there really. They need to go down to Tillamook or up to Seaside to get everything, food, resources, um, you name it. And so Highway 101, that's their lifeline um, they need. And so we can see that consistently scoring the highest across the list. Um, so that sort of lets us know that this prioritization process is hitting the mark of, of what people think is important. The next set of things is um, resonates with us on, on what we were hearing. This is beach access. This is critical utilities like water, sanitation, pump stations. Um, those sort of things that, that we heard in conversation during the workshop are important. Those things are coming out in our scoring prioritization. Um, so again, we think this shows that uh, we have sort of the right metrics in there. So once we viewed what's at risk with our impact explorer, we've prioritized uh, what to uh, protect with our assessment tool. We move into the final tool in our kit, the sea level rise planning guide for the Oregon coast. Um, and as it mentions there, this is just version one. This is gonna be a living document that we update based on this fellowship process, uh, based on what we see other states doing. We're looking to California and Washington to see how their sea level rise processes go. Um, and so I think this picture does a really good job. Hopefully through this, we're gonna help communities change direction from going straight for that sea level rise uh, to taking a turn towards drier horizons in the future. So taking a quick look, um, there's quite a few sections in here, uh, explanations of our map tool and our assessment tool, land use goals that are relevant, adaptation strategies ranging from equitable planning guidelines to shoreline stabilization, 
Um, but you know, it's not meant to be cover to cover read. This is supposed to be a menu of options to for different communities to look through. Well, I'll say the realignment, which is managed retreat, is a real page turner section. Um, I'm a big fan of nature-based solutions, so I'm gonna spend a moment here. Um, the page on the left here is from our guide, showing a dynamic revetment in Cape Lookout State Park. Um, so we're advocating for this sort of solution. On the right, you can see uh, a sh vegetative stabilization project in Cannon Beach. Uh, and also on the left side of that picture, sort of in the, the middle there, uh, is some riprap. And so we're focusing on these dunes, grasses, dynamic revetments, um, as opposed to the harder solutions of seawalls and riprap's, things that have a benefit in the immediate, but can really lead to a lot of erosion of beaches uh, and reducing of those coastal resources. I also want to highlight some of what I think are the most important parts of the guide um, that really were sort of the focus of my fellowship. Equitable adaptation planning is a really big one. Oregon faces growing inequalities that unfairly disadvantage large segments of the population. And on top of this, climate change exacerbates existing risks, risks in those communities. Um, so equitable, adapt equitable adaptation planning doesn't mean having a one size fits all approach and doing that with everyone. Uh, we think it means trying to ensure that our engagement levels with different communities are equitable. Um, so we need to work differently with different communities. I mentioned earlier that we did not have success in our first attempt meeting with the Latinx community. Um, so we know we need to change up our strategy with that community. Um, I wish I could say this photo was from one of my workshops this is from a previous DLCD workshop. Um, but to reach that Latinx community, we know we need to build trust by working with local organizations, trusted academic groups like folks here at OSU and the COPES, Cascadia COPES Hub um, have been really more successful in getting into these communities. Um, they're a little more agile than a state agency is. And so by partnering with them and piggybacking on efforts that they're doing, we can sort of get in there um, and begin to build trust with these communities. To do so, um, we went up to the Latinx Heritage Festival in Seaside, Oregon, and just set up a table there. You know, let people come by and see some of these maps um, without having to bring them into a government-run workshop that can be scary for a lot of those communities. Um, this is part of our extended place-based community forums and targeted outreach, making sure we're um, reaching all the people we need to. I also think this is really been a story in developing our participatory process, having this bottom-up um, ideal where we're hearing from community members about what they want to see done and then helping that happen. Um, so in working towards that, it meant meeting communities where they are. Uh, this is us in the Brown Mead Grange. Um, you know, these folks were so happy to hear that we were doing a workshop there. Um, they sent out letters to everyone, contacted senators and elected officials and told them to come. Um, they were really excited about this. And I think part of that was that we were meeting them where they were. We were having repeated in-person face-to-face uh, -face encounters that really let them know we're, we're on their team. Um, it also meant getting out to reach other populations. You know, we found out that just because you hold a workshop on a weeknight when people might be available, you're not hitting that younger segment of the population. So we needed to get out into the schools, make sure we're reaching students, because um, those are the people who are really going to feel a lot of the brunt of these impacts. So uh, and beginning to wrap up, this project has taught us the importance of meeting people where they are, as I've mentioned. Um, identifying that sea level rise is a slow process. It's not as urgent as other issues. Um, we ran into sort of this, everyone's so ready for tsunamis. And when you talk about flooding on the coast, everyone thinks about immediate flooding. What am I gonna do when it happens? And sea level rise is a little different. It's, it's a slower process. It's maybe a sustained flooding during a king tide event, uh, but then it goes away. And so it's a different type of adaptation and it's a different mindset that people need to take. Um, so we learned a lot about sort of pushing that proactive to sea level rise. You know, it might not be as bad as you think the tsunami is gonna be, it's, it's not but it's something that we can do something about right now. It's slow on the North Coast, it's slowly building. Um, and so if we start working now, we can really make an impact on that. Um, we also wanna consider natural options. Um, we've seen from some of the recent NOAA funding opportunities this summer uh, that nature-based solutions are a funding priority for the government. And so we wanna encourage folks who need to fund their projects to consider some of these nature-based solutions in there. Um, and I just want to highlight that community engagement and the communication that we've been doing is uh, a process, not a destination. It's something that you're going to keep doing. You don't just have one of these workshops and say, we did it, we're done. 
Uh, the workshop is just one step in getting into communities to help them. So some of the next steps we're working on in this adaptation process. Um, obviously, funding is a really big one. So I mentioned we pursued uh, a NOAA Climate Resilience Regional Challenge grant. And we actually worked with the Columbia River Estuary Study Task Force, CREST, works along the river. Um, and our LOI has succeeded. So we're through that first round and we're working up our full application due in February. So we're really hopeful that that will bring some sea level rise coordination work uh, to the Columbia River. You know, Oregon and Washington are facing the exact same issue on both sides of the river, uh, but are dealing with it in different ways. They've been holding workshops that are quite different than our workshops. Um, and so I think collaborating across the river there could bring some really great benefit um, and cross pollination of ideas. We're also building capacity for communities to adapt themselves. Um, so this is an example from our Estuary Resilience Action Plans, ERAPs, um, which are going on here in Equina Bay and Coos Bay and further up the coast. Um, but here, you know, we can help communities identify how easy it is to implement a project. How much is it going to cost to do so? What's going to be the potential benefit of that? Um, and really give them the, the ability to weigh those different priorities and select the right project for them. We're also connecting academic researchers with communities to study some of these sea level rise impacts. So I mentioned the OSU COPES hub. Um, we've connected researchers there with communities in Arch Cape and Cannon Beach to study dynamic revetments around their beach access points. These are really critical to those communities and they're definitely feeling the brunt of sea level rise. Um, and so it's been really great to connect them with researchers. And then I mentioned um, community preparedness. So we're trying to help these folks set up these community emergency response teams in Clatsop County. Um, because during these flood events, um, the folks who are going to help you the most are your neighbors, are, are the folks right around you. Um, and so we found out during this workshop that folks didn't feel like they had a lot of connection. They didn't feel like they knew what to do when we showed them these maps. You know, what's that going to be like? And so I think the CERT team up there is going to be a really good option to help that community feel more prepared for this. Right now, we're developing some one pagers to reach back out to the communities. I think it's really important to let them know that we're still in the corner, in their corner, uh, that these workshops weren't just a, a one off process, um, that we're going to sustain this assistance to them um, and really help them adapt into the future. With that, thank you. Happy to take questions. Wonderful. We have time for questions, which is Plenty great because I've got several, um, but I want to kind of bounce back and forth between folks online and folks in the room. So any questions for folks online? Okay. So anybody online, if you have a question for our speaker, please put it into the chat box. How about questions in the room? There we go. <laughs> Give me just a second. I had a question on, you said on the outreach for uh, communities what's the what's the hispanic population of seaside that you're starting with that you're trying to target because i think that's a challenge sometimes just if the numbers are fairly low to start with it's harder to to get engagement yeah totally um i mean i think we chose seaside because we worked with again consejo hispano is a, a local community group up there um and they said they thought seaside would be a good place to do it they told us uh, the time and day of the week that we thought would be good. And so we we really did our best um, up there. And I'll say there's a number of things that affected it. And I think most of it is probably on us, but that was the nicest day in March you've ever seen. It was 70 degrees and sunny. And I don't think anyone wanted to be inside. Um, but you're right. It's, it's hard to know with a population like that, um, that isn't always um, responding to census surveys, um, isn't always the most engaged in the traditional way. Um, but that's why these local community groups are so important because they're the ones that folks trust. Um, it's tough to say, you know, host a workshop as the government and invite people from that community in. It, it's not always a trusting environment. And so that piggybacking with other groups has been really important to help us reach them. I, I think just the other observation is uh, Seaside gets a lot of press from the tsunami modeling that, uh, you know, if they have the big one, Seaside is toast, you know, and so there's a lot of debate about where the school should go and where they should move them and the, yeah, well, the yeah. cost of all of those things. So, I mean, I think being able to use some of the work that's already been done on the tsunami modeling um, 
is, is might be helpful. Absolutely. There are a lot of parallels between sea level rise and tsunamis. A lot of the, the two maps look exactly the same. When people come up at these um, public events and, and see, the, oh, this is a tsunami map. It's like, no, it looks just like one, but it's sea level rise. Um, and there's a lot of co-benefits there. A lot of the preparedness of um, you know transportation and evacuation routes are very similar between those two. Um, Resources and supplies that folks have in the community and, and feel good knowing where they are um, have a lot of parallels. So as I walk, any questions online? I think not oh, yet. So my yeah, my question as I go up there, um, can you talk a little bit about when you say community resilience? Um, who were you addressing with these tools? Was it me as an individual or is it an agency within the county or the city that you were working with? Yeah, yeah. It's a great one. Um, our goal with this was really to hear from community members. We have a pretty clear line of communication with cities and counties. As I mentioned, they're part of the Oregon Coastal Management Program. And so it's pretty easy to ask, you know, what's what's your big um, project you're looking for? You know, what flooding impact are you trying to fund? Um, but we were really shooting to hear from people, you know, like where's the park that they meet up with that's flooding that has an impact on farmers markets that really sort of make a place what it is and give people a, a feeling of being home. Um, so I think we were shooting for more of those um, emotional level responses to what sea level rise will do and, and how a community can stay intact um, when really there's going to be some significant change in a lot of places. Thanks for your uh, talk, Carl. Uh, I'm curious to hear a little more about this program and uh, I guess, is there a fellow that's assigned to each coastal county or is Clatsop being used as sort of like a representative county um, through your fellowship and just a little more how that works? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the fellowship application uh, that was submitted years ago uh, was specific to Clatsop County. Clatsop County has the greatest risk to sea level rise. Um, when you look at some of those maps, especially around Warrington, Lewis and Clark, I mean, it's almost everywhere. Um and so that was chosen as the most at-risk county that could use uh, sort of the most in-depth assistance with that. And then city of Cannon Beach put their hand up uh, at the right time. And so that's how we're working with them. And then Fort Stevens State Park plays a really big role um, right along the jetty there. They work with Army Corps. Um, so there's a lot of issues there. And we're hoping that this process um, will be transferable. Unfortunately, I am not going to be a fellow uh, come August. And so we don't exactly have someone to work with the next county down. We had people from Tillamook come to some of our workshops and you know put their hands up, us next. Um, and so we're, as part of this, trying to come up with a plan that um, can support jurisdictions to do this themselves. You know how, how to host something like a workshop, how to show people these maps and ask some of these questions um, in a way that what was really important we found was being sensitive to the fact that we're showing some really scary maps to a lot of people. Um, and so I think a, a bit of that of like how to have some sensitivity to that will be important for other counties that want to carry this out. Okay, a question online. Are the community groups you met with organized in any way or were there different people in each meeting with the same community? Yeah, so communities had different level um, of sort of cohesiveness. So I mentioned Arch Cape and Brownsmead, I would say those two sort of the, the bookend workshops we held um, are really cohesive communities. They're small, they're tight knit, um, and everyone is sort of feeling that same impact. Again, Brownsmead being surrounded by dikes, everyone is at risk from sea level rise. Um, and so those ones were really tight knit, but Lewis and Clark area, you know, between Warrington and Astoria, uh, it's an unincorporated area and there's not necessarily like a community center right there that folks um, identify with. And so that was a little more disjointed. And that's why out of that workshop, um, the community emergency response team has sort of risen as the highest priority. Um, so there's different levels. We had a couple of folks come to multiple workshops. We had one county commissioner come to three of them. Uh, shout out to Leanne Thompson, who's recently joined the Land Conservation and Development Commission. Um, yeah, she was a really great representative to have out there. Hi, thanks. Uh, great talk, Carl. Um, I'm curious. Uh, I think it's really valuable getting the community input, and I'm curious how that then gets communicated to decision makers, and then if how decision makers are then sort of held accountable either to communicate back to the community 
or to demonstrate that they've listened to what the community's priorities were yeah. so that the community then feels incentivized to engage again the next time. Yes. Yeah. That's a really, really great point. Um, I mean, right now I'm working on building up these one pager responses. So we're going to get those back to the communities um, to sort of clarify like, Hey, these are the things we heard, you know, here's the breakdown of what the different types of responses were. And here's what we want to pursue. We want to help you pursue. Um, so that's going to be a bit of a temperature check on on how was our listening, and then we're working directly with Clatsop County uh, and the City of Cannon Beach, and so those jurisdictions are going to get all of our results. Um, they're thirsty to have those and to be able to use that. Um, another one of the uh, materials we're going to give back that you know I'll just go to here. Going to look something like this. Um, and so what those different categories are, gosh, I can't even read them on my screen, uh, but giving people, you know, how easy is it to implement? What's the impact, the cost, the priority? I think a list like this for a jurisdiction is a really useful way for them to see, okay, this is what we heard. This is what people say they want to do. And are we looking to spend a little bit of extra funding right now so we can do sort of this easy project that'll give us a little benefit? Or are we looking at some more capital funding where we want to really support something over a couple of years? Um, so we're trying to facilitate that handoff of these materials to the jurisdiction. Because again, once my fellowship is over, it's it's up to the folks there to do this adaptation. It's a really great point. Thanks, Carl. Nice talk. Um, I'd like to hear you speak a bit more about perhaps the longer sort of term um, input that you got. I mean, we're looking at quite the range from, I believe you said three inches to a foot and a half. Yeah. And you talked a lot about, you know, the storm events and the, you know, the, the coastal flooding that is relatively temporary, but mm -hmm. over a much longer time period, obviously, you know, or the 30 year mortgage sort of scenario time period um, you know, what, and I understand that a lot of the people that you were talking to were over 60. They might not last long enough, right? And so their priorities may be very different. So again, I'd like to hear a bit more about, and perhaps this is some of it, but that longer time frame and the priorities that you got maybe from some of the younger folks or, you know, maybe not, I don't know, or how to engage with those that are in between. Yeah. The high schoolers and the over sixties. Totally. Um, so let me think about how I answer that. Yeah. So we did encounter a number of folks who, when we show this 1.5 feet and we say that it's is 30 to 50 years, um, we just throw up their hands and say, well, I'm not going to be here. And so that was a bit frustrating uh, in some of the workshops and is a, a bit of a sort of messaging thing that we're trying to, to understand how best to get that across. You know, how do we trigger a little more of an emotional response that says like, this is something that even if I'm not here, I want to do something about. Um, so I think talking about the community as a whole and the changes it's going to experience, um, if folks really connect with um, you know, this coastal park or something, and we say that that's going to go away in the future, that might be a little more of that emotional response that gets folks to say, you know, I should do something because this park is bigger than me. Um, we're also working, yeah, to reach that middle population. We're doing an event at Fort George and at the Coastal House, Coastal Coastal Brewing in Cannon Beach. So we're trying to do some of these, um, shall we say, livelier community events where we might get some of that middle population um, yeah, and as for the the youngsters, the high schoolers, um, it was, I think, sobering for a number of them to hear some of these. And and I think that generation gets a lot of the, the climate doom and gloom of like, well, it's happening and it's here and what are we going to do? Um, so what we were really trying to harp there is that, um, you know, by telling us what you care about, um, you're, you're letting us know what to protect, what you want to protect. Um, and so we really tried to highlight that for that age uh, group. But yeah, it's it's tough to adapt something that is so slow you can you can barely see it happening. Um, so it's definitely uh, a, a messaging and communication conundrum of how to get people to respond to something that can't really see. Um, but you mentioned also um, 
that storm events play a big role. We we talked about that even as we went on that it's it's really compound flooding. You know, it's a storm during a king tide, and then there's sea level rise, and so communicating that um, it's not just sea level rise we're talking about. We're just talking about these flooding events that you're experiencing now. Um, I hope that answered your question. I know it was a bit rambly. All right, question online. I noticed on your impact assessment tool, you have tabs for coping capacity and vulnerability. Can you talk a little bit about how those were evaluated and are those results publicly available? Yeah, so someone's into Excel, nice. Um, so the different tabs on here, um, assess different parts of risk. So exposure is easy. Uh, it's what sea level rise layer you're on on the map. Risk class, again, is easy. We just use those FEMA definitions. Users is a little more tricky, but generally we can sort of suss out who, who uses a type of building. Um, sensitivity to damage, coping capacity, and vulnerability are a little harder. They require a little more understanding of the community. Um, so sensitivity to damage is related to, you know, if if sea level rise did come, if there was flooding in the basement during a king tide or something, what would that do to you? If you're a restaurant and you store everything down there, that might be the end of all of your product. It might be a really big deal. But if it's just a park, um, you know, it can flood and then it can dry up. Um, and so that sensitivity to damage can be different based on that. Coping capacity um, and vulnerability relate to, you know, what would your response be? Would you have to change your whole business operation? Would would this park cease to exist as it does today? Um, and so it's sort of different for each community. And yeah, it's it's tough to work through those. I mean, not tough. It just takes more than just our workshops. Um, we're having to do a little further outreach to figure out some of those scores to help really hone in on, on what exactly should be prioritized. Um, and as a question of, are these available? So this impact assessment tool is available. These examples uh, will be uh, already filled in for you at the Coastal Atlas uh, link that I mentioned. Um, but the results that we're working on with each community are private to those communities. So we're going to share those with the county, um, but we're not going to make that data uh, publicly available, I don't believe. Great talk, Carl. Um, had a chance to hear a similar presentation at State of the Coast, and yeah. there was a staff from uh, DLC, uh, DLCD that was talking about uh, cumulative effects, um, say for uh, shoreline armoring and riprap and things like that. Um, can you just touch a little bit on how um, you know that was kind of playing into maybe some discussions you were having with communities? And then another, you know, brief question is: um, Did you present any visualizations of sea level rise to communities through any of like the viewers or mm -hmm. like the apps that actually you know kind of visualize visualize that? And uh, did you get feedback from? communities using that? Yeah, well, I'll start with the second part first because that's the easiest one to answer. Uh, no, we did not. I had, there are some pretty nifty tools out there um, to sort of visualize what water would look like. You can show on a map and say this building might flood, uh, but it's it's hard to imagine a place flooding that's never flooded before. Um, so we mentioned that those tools are out there, but we didn't utilize that in our workshops. Um, but as to your question about some of the different shoreline armoring, that came up quite a bit. Um, it's a big conversation for us right now with OPRD, um, who permits those different projects. And like I mentioned, we we really encourage folks to look to those nature-based solutions. Um, in Oregon statute, I don't think, I think buildings built after January 1st, 1973 aren't even eligible for riprap. Um, and so there's a conversation around, you know, who gets riprap and who doesn't. Um, and then we're encouraging like I said, those softer solutions and and really a mindset shift. People look at that and, you know, they put up, um, you know, these sort of sand burritos, we call them. They do some grass restoration and then a big winter storm comes and it, it looks a little ragged and they say, well, that didn't work. Uh, let's put up riprap. And so we're trying to change that dynamic to say, you know, think about it. If, if you, let's say you do have riprap, um, if the riprap failed, you would, you would fix it, right? You would go back and repair it to get that protection back. It's the same thing with a dynamic revetment. Um, it's there to take on the brunt of that wave force and it's gonna break down through that and that means you need to repair it. Um, and so we're trying to encourage folks to think about that process um, and these, again, sort of softer solutions as not just a hoop to jump through, 
but that's that's the destination is this new one and i think sort of getting at i mentioned a few times sort of the like emotional way of, of getting the stuff across um you know riprap and seawalls we have pretty good evidence uh reduces beach width um, it really plays a big role in eroding those beaches and so folks it's sort of interesting that folks who live on the coast uh, care so much about the beach and their house there, but they want to do riprap that's damaging that beach. And so we're trying to sort of tease that apart with them and, and encourage folks to think about it a little differently. Can I be selfish and ask you to go to, back to the um, Yukuna Bay map? Oh, yeah. And just let folks know, if you don't know, there is a dynamic revetment on the nature trail um, right here um, at Hatfield. So if you haven't seen one and what it looks like, we have one here. Um, okay, questions online. Go ahead, Roseanne. Are homeowners worried about property values for vulnerable areas? Certainly. <laughs> um, in Cannon Beach in particular, um, being such a tourist destination and a second homeowner um, sort of community, I, I think they said that 60 to 70% of the homes there are second homes and vacation rentals. Um, people certainly care about their property value there. Um, and homeowners want to know what the state is going to do about it. Um, and so that's, that's this conversation around what protection looks like. Um, and there's going to be some really big changes. I mean, the, the property line of, of the recreational easement for the beach is based on high water marks. Um, and so that, that is changing. We're having the ocean literally taking over people's property and it's it's really evolving right now um i kind of made a joke about realignment being a hot topic and managed retreat but it is that's what's happening um and folks are having to think about that we steered clear of that direct um line of adaptation in our workshops i know it can be really emotionally charged for a lot of people so we you know we let them know it was there but we tried not to get too much into what that looks like because that's a it's a whole nother can of worms in Oregon, how are the insurance companies using this information? I do not know. Uh, we didn't have quite the um, whole blue that the fire maps did. Um, so luckily, we've avoided that type of press. Um, but it'll be really interesting to hear. Um, I don't think they're required to say anything right now about sea level rise layers. I'm sure they talk about tsunamis. But um, yeah, some of these big changes are, are not necessarily talked about. All right, questions in the room. <laughs> um, I can give you a feedback on the insurance. I was, oh yeah, we were looking for houses about a year and a half ago, and so we were looking near South Jetty, which the flood risk was seven out of ten. It's like, oh, that's not good. And then we we're looking up the hill, you know, from South Beach, and our insurance or our mortgage company said, the thing you know that flood insurance is never going down. And we took that to heart and said, yes, I think you're right. It's, it's never going down. So um, I, I just had the question of when you did these meetings, was there a discussion of land use planning or zoning at the county level to where there's some places that are just not good places to build or not good places to build in the future? Absolutely. Um, I mean, the North Coast of Oregon is really... Um, uh, housing burdened uh there there's just not enough places for folks to live there especially with the bit of the tourist economy up there um folks need to live to work in all the shops and businesses but those aren't the type of homes that are available there a lot of the time and so there is a really big disparity in what's there and what's needed um and it is pretty easy to look at a flood area that might flood sometimes but doesn't flood regularly and say oh that's a great place to put some homes um and we're really trying to steer that clear um, because often that gets into really sticky environmental justice issues where you're putting these low-income housing in hazard zones because the insurance will be so high and, and all that and so we're we're trying to steer that in the right direction um, but it's that's a tough one up there on the north coast for sure all right if you haven't noticed already hatfield uh visitor center is underwater on this map <laughs> Uh, any other questions online? Not at this time. How about any other questions in the room? All right. Let's give uh, Carl one more round of applause. Thank you.
Uh, thank you all so much for being here, um, either in the room and online. I think for folks in the room, if you have a few follow-up questions, Carl might stick around for a few minutes yeah. and you can answer those. Um, for everybody, hope to see you next week. And thank you so much for being part of seminar. Thanks, everyone.